it's, it's easy to understand, am I right? It's, it's easy to understand, and, and, and that's one of the reasons why all these years, so many years later, all, all the Christian churches, we get along so well. We all get along so well in our theology. And this world is so much a better place now because John 3, 16, it's, it's so easy to understand. And you're looking at me right now like, oh, pastor, what planet are you on? Maybe we don't get along so well. Maybe we don't. It seems simple. It seems so positive, and yet, like so many of the teachings of Jesus, we have done a fine job of using it to separate people, of using it to separate ourselves from others, and in many ways to justify, if not our physical violence, at least the violence of our thoughts. And I will tell you that. If, if I were allowed to have a problem with stuff, if I were allowed to have a problem with people, and I start with myself, I start with having a problem with myself, it's when people take the words of the Prince of Peace and use them to justify our own vile intentions. So I, I think about that and I, and I find myself asking, well, well okay, why is that? Why should these beautiful words of, of, of Jesus, especially these particular words, the ones that so many theologians have thought so highly of, why should they cause such contention? Yes, there could be a lot of reasons, but the simplest to me seems that maybe, just maybe we don't understand what the words mean. Maybe we actually don't understand the words. Right now you're probably saying, well, well you know, it's, it's not that difficult. Just maybe go ahead and look at it right now. It's not that difficult. Verse 16 right there. For God so loved the world that he gave up. It sounds simple. So I started thinking about this and I said, well, let, let's just take it apart. The first word of real significance, at least in English, is um, God. And uh, I decided we're just going to pass on that today. I don't know about you, but my mind is finite. I can say a lot about God, but I'm not going to try to define God. So I thought we'd start with something a little simple, something we all understand, something that we all know about, this thing that makes the, the world go around. The next word of significance, the first verb in the statement, love. And we all know what love is, right? We all understand love. You know, maybe we've been in love. Then we love it. Well, right away, you understand we have complexities. For example, last night I was driving around really late, and I hadn't had supper. And again, those of you who know, when I don't have supper, I get grouchy. I get mean. Even meaner than usual. And at some point, I said to myself, you know what? I would really love something to eat. And, and so let me see, I love something to eat. I love my father. I really love this verse. And we can go on and on like that. You, you all have your own, you all have your own examples. And, and we realize that love can be so many things in, in, in English. We use that word for so much. Sometimes we use it sarcastically. Sometimes we always use it as an insult. I have this one word. One word. It is, by the way, a four-letter word. So, so before we even think about that, we know God so loved the world. Well, the, the Bible, of course, is not written in English. The Bible is written in something called Koine Greek. And, and there are a number of words for love in Koine Greek. They are agape. Agape, which, by the way, is the word that's used in this text. Agape is... Um, a sacrificial love. That's the kind of love that Jesus did when he died on the cross. That's the kind of love that Jesus says we should do when we have to love our enemies. And, and, and then there's um, eros. Eros is typically defined as romantic love. Man and woman love. Physical love. And it is filios. Filios is brotherly love. A love of strong affection. Perhaps the love
love between friends. And uh, of course, our, our text, our text here uses the word agape. It uses the word agape, uh, sacrificial love. And I thought about that for a while. I said, well, that, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense in, in, in a way, because after all, God so loved the world that he did what? He gave. That's the next verb there. He, he gave. He gave. Gave what? His one and only son. So, so we see a sacrificial nature to this. But even that didn't, it didn't sit right. This a, a fact dawned on me. Below the Bible was written in Koine Greek, Jesus didn't speak Koine Greek. And, and we could suggest that maybe it's even more complex than that, because you see, in, in Hebrew, there are 13 different words for love. But about that for a while, and maybe not very long, because there's something that I, I, I do know about this a little bit. That most of the time when Jesus was talking to his friends and talking to people on the street, he didn't speak Hebrew either. He spoke Aramaic. What's interesting about Aramaic is Aramaic, like English, has only one word for love. One word for love. By the way, the word is Rahma. Rahma is, is, is the word for love in, in, in Aramaic. And so all of a sudden, we're right back to where we started from. Well, sure, a person writing this down in Greek is going to use agape, whatever, what else would they do? But agape allows us to believe something that might not be true. You see, even though Norman here keeps stealing my bologna sandwiches, time in and time out, God tells me that I have to love those who hurt me. I have to do good to those who persecute me, even steal my bloody sandwiches. And that kind of love is agape. Which means that I might have to love Norman, and he might even have to love me, but I don't necessarily have to like Norman. And he doesn't have to like me. It's true. And I'm sure you've experienced that in life. I'm sure you've experienced people that you might recognize who love them. Maybe you love them because you have to. Because the Bible says you should. Maybe you love them because they're some sort of a relative or something. But maybe you don't like them. To suggest that this is how God loves the world. God loves the world, but perhaps doesn't like it. Is, is what God may just might imply. Maybe. So I wondered about Jesus speaking. Is that all? Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus at the moment. Jesus is saying he's speaking to Nicodemus. And he's speaking Aramaic, the language of the everyday language of people. And, and Jesus would use this word, rachma, and it would be just as ambiguous in Aramaic as it would be in, in English. And although, as you probably know, I'm a big fan of parsing things out in, in, in Greek, because I often think of having more words for something is better. Sometimes I wonder if there's a place where it would be better to have just one word. Let me give you an example. You see, I think one of the reasons why some cultures only develop one word for love is because it may be very difficult to parse out. It may be very difficult to parse out what we mean by that. Now, this might embarrass some of you when I talk about this. It might even embarrass me, so if I turn red behind the ears, you'll know why. But take, for example, a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. Now, sometimes husbands have a problem with this, and sometimes wives have a problem with this, but let's say they don't have a problem. And the husband says to the wife something I'm sure most wives want to hear. He says, honey, I love you. Now, that's a simple statement. It's, you know, three little words. Three little words that we say can fix everything. I love you. But what does a man mean by that? We can 
parse that out, we can say, well, does he mean agape? Does he mean philios? Does he mean eros? Which is it? And I want to suggest to you there's a reason why cultures maybe have developed this one word. Because maybe it's not possible in a relationship that is rich and full to parse that out entirely. For example, the husband who says to his wife, I love you, he very well on one level mean agape. He very well might mean, I am willing to give to you and for you. I am willing to sacrifice for you. I am willing to give of my substance for you. And wouldn't that be wonderful? But I would imagine that most wives want more than that. He might also mean filius. He might mean, you know what, I really like you. I really like the time we spend together. I enjoy our conversations. I think you're a neat person. I really like who you are. And he might mean eros as well. He might really mean, I desire you. I want to be close to you. I want for us to be connected in a physical way. In fact, I would suggest that a relationship is full and rich. It probably means all of those things. At different times, certain aspects of that may take precedence, but the reality is it probably means all of those things. And more. Because words only begin to describe the fullness of a human experience. No matter how many we have. And I will suggest to you, maybe, this is just speculative, I can't know this, but just maybe, when Jesus undoubtedly used that word, Rachma, maybe God not only loves the world sacrificially, maybe God also likes the world. Maybe God also likes the people in the world, has affection for them. Maybe God loves on so many levels. We can begin to understand it. And if that's true, if that's really true, that changes so many things. After all, it changes our understanding of who God is and who God can be. And it may even change our understanding of who we are in God's sight. So, right away we begin to see that there may be more to this. God so loved the world. And undoubtedly sacrifice is part of that. Maybe God also likes the world. Maybe God likes Mormon. And God really likes Elfrida. Maybe God even likes Elfrida's cat. So we, 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 can go, we can go through all this. And of course, we don't have time to go through every single word in this and suggest every possible meaning. So I, I'd like to get to uh, another significant part of this. We read down this a little bit further. For God so loved the world, Love the first adjective, and, or a verb rather, and gave the next verb. And then finally we have another verb, and this one's on us. Believe. Believe. And I want to suggest to you that's the most dangerous one. It's the most dangerous one because the, as difficult as it is to understand love, it may be more difficult to understand belief. For a significant portion of the Christian church will tell you that if you don't believe, if you don't believe the way we do, you're out of luck. What is it to believe? Any thoughts? I know that's almost as hard as asking you to define what is love. Reality, truth. Reality, truth, okay. Yeah, I, I, would, I would say that um, for the most part, we talk about belief. We have a sense that we know something is. For example, there, there are very few people who dispute that there was such a person named George Washington, the father of our country. We believe there was a George Washington. But I would like to suggest something beyond that. You, you see, the scripture talks 
talks about belief. Maybe, just maybe, it's talking about more than an understanding that something is. I'd like to give you an example in the form of a story. Um, I, I spent a lot of time painting houses. Um, we used to paint houses uh, partly for a living, tried to pay for school painting houses, painted a lot of houses. And because whatever portion of the human mind that says you're supposed to be afraid of high prices is faulting in me, I got to climb ladders a lot. <clears throat> I got to paint things that were really high up in the air. And at one point I'm working with this fellow. He, he was an older man. Um, he was probably in his early 80s. But he was still up there climbing ladders. He loved to be up in the air. He loved to paint. So I'm working with this guy. The young guy and the old guy. And we're up there. We're having a look at him. One of the guys. The young guy and the old guy. There. I'm up there with Charlie. And um, we are at a particularly difficult place. We're two portions of this roof. One portion goes like this. The other portion goes like this. And we need to paint this trim. We realize the only way we're going to do this the only way we're going to do this safely is if we lash ourselves to the chimney. Or more specifically, the antenna mast on top of the chimney. Now, I see some of you are looking a little nervous already. Well, if you believe, and you might see where I'm going with this, if you believe you know what you're doing, maybe it's not so scary. So, I'm about to tie the knot on, and Charlie is much more experienced than I am, and is at this point 60 some odd years older than me. Says, Here, let me tie the knot. I've got a lot of experience. I can tie a great knot. I used to get a long short of it. So, I tie the knot I'm responsible for, the one around my waist. And Charlie ties the one around the masthead of the chimney. And, um,. Before I'm willing to support my weight, which wasn't as much as it is now, I tested the knot. And it came flying off. And I looked at Charlie in a way that wasn't particularly loving at that moment. And he said, sorry. You see, I didn't particularly believe in Charlie's knot. But there was something that I believed in very, very firmly. The law of gravity. <laughs> you see, I wasn't afraid of the law of gravity. I wasn't afraid of heights. But I also knew what happened if I fell 45 feet. I believed firmly in the law of gravity. But what's interesting about that is not only that I believe it existed, not only could I cite certain facts about it because I was a pretty good physics student, but I also adjusted my behavior to it. I also reacted to it. I also lived my life by it. You see, my belief caused me to live my life in accord with the reality in which I believed. And if I hadn't done that, there's a distinct possibility I wouldn't be standing here talking to you right now. Because I believed in that law of gravity. And acted accordingly. And said, I'll tie my own! Darn. No. Our text says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, and whoever believes in him. We're not talking about an acknowledgement of a fact. We're not talking about, well, I'm a Christian as opposed to a Muslim. I'm a Presbyterian as opposed to some other kind of Christian. That what scripture says, whosoever believes, we are talking about talking about how we react to this presupposition of fact. Do we change our lives accordingly? Do we trust that? Do we live as if we understood the reality? So we go through this text, we go through this text, and the next part, the next part I often like to remind people, especially people who, especially people who bring up the concept of what happens if you don't believe, and their assumption is, well, if you don't believe, I, I guess you're going to go to, um, yeah, hell. No. 
not believe stands condemned already. Any attempt to translate Koine Greek into English is going to be impure and imperfect because there are tenses that exist in Greek that do not exist in English. It can be done, but it doesn't make a very nice looking product. But in this particular case, without playing too many linguistic gymnastic games, we, we can already see perhaps what Jesus was trying to get at. The first part is easy to understand, it's comforting, and even if we use my definition, whoever trusts in him, whoever adjusts his or her life accordingly to the reality of Christ, is not condemned. But now we get to this next part. Whoever does not believe, whoever does not believe is going to go to hell. Is that what it says? Well, I'll tell you what I wrote in my notes. I didn't know I'd have the courage to say it, but now that I've told you about it, I just will. You know, is it saying whoever does not believe is going to go to hell? Hell no, it doesn't say that. I was going to that church. It doesn't say that at all. It says that whoever does not believe is already condemned, is already there, is already separated from God. It's not a matter of where God is going to send you. God doesn't have to send you anywhere. And if you don't quite get it, we go on to the next part, verse 19. This is the judgment. This is the verdict, as your translation reads. This is the judgment. Light has come into the world. Who's the light? Jesus is the light. Light has come into the world, but men... The human species, unfortunately, that means the women too. Women, men, humans loved darkness instead of light. You see, that's where we all are. Separated from God. Separated from the light. Until what? Until we begin by God's grace by the power of His Holy Spirit to adjust our lives to the reality. When we ignore the reality of Christ, we are already condemned. On the other hand, when we adjust ourselves, when we recognize that our own knock around the chimney is not going to hold us, when we adjust ourselves, reality of Christ. There we find our everlasting, our boundless spiritual life. And here's just a little piece of good news on top of the good news. This is not a one-time offer. God does not make a limited offer that expires in midnight. This is an offer that goes out over If you find yourself in a place where you know the facts, but recognize that you haven't adjusted your life, and I will tell you that I have found myself in this place numerous times, and you may have as well. If you find yourself and you're in this place, and you're not loving the light, and you're really preferring the darkness, 